All right, so we have read Mark 10, verses 17 to 31. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to dive in today and see what God has for us from his word this morning. So, Father, we do thank you so much just for this day that you have given to us. Lord, we thank you so much just for the word of God that we hold before us on our laps this morning or on our device, Lord God, where we can look at and see not just words on a page or words on a screen, but we can see the truth coming directly from your heart. Lord, not only is your word a love letter for us to get to know you better, but Father God, it is a guide by which we can walk. It is a guide by which we can pattern our lives after. And so Lord, I pray that today as we have your word before us, that you will speak to us through this passage of scripture. That you will just make known to us the things that we need to do in our lives to be able to apply these truths. And you will help us, Lord, to not just be hearers of your word, but to be doers of it. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I don't know if you know, remember or not, but earlier this summer there was a news story that captured the headlines for about a week or so. It was a story about the sudden disappearance of Titan. Anybody remember that? Uh, that Ocean Gate submarine that sank while going down to, you know, observe the remains of the Titanic. If you don't remember, I have a picture here for you. It's hard to see on the projector because the bulb's going down. But there it is, the submarine that all of a sudden disappeared. According to reports, communications were lost an hour and 45 minutes into the descent, and the authorities were contacted when the submarine failed to resurface later that day as had been originally planned. Now, many things about this story at the time were a mystery, and people around the world kind of held their breath and waited in anticipation for the vessel to resurface, only to find that that would not be the case. Now, most experts believe that a catastrophic explosion caused the submarine to sink, which resulted in the loss of the five lives that were on board this submarine. Now, there's a lot of mysterious things about this story, but one of the craziest things about the story was actually how much it cost to get a ticket for this underwater excursion. Anybody remember reading about this or hearing about this? One ticket to get on this submarine and go and see the remains of the Titanic cost $250,000. $250,000 to get a seat on the Titan so you could go underwater all those miles and observe the remains of the Titanic. Now, I don't know that I would ever want to take an underwater trip like this, especially one that ended like that, right? But I do know this. Whether I wanted to or not, I don't have $250,000 to spend on a ticket, and maybe you're with me, right? But obviously, there were some people who did. And the reality of the matter is this. The more money you have, the more doors you can often open in life. Don't you find that to be true? The more money you have, the more opportunities you can often avail yourself to. Let me give you an example. Most of us in this room, right? fly commercial. But there are people in the world, and if you're here and this is you, I need to get to know you a little bit better, but there are people in this world who fly with a private jet that they happen to own, right? They have an opportunity, an open door that most of us common folk, right, don't get. It's a difference between owning a Ford, and I'm not looking down on you if that's you, and owning a Lamborghini, right? There's just some things that money offers you that maybe a lack of money does not. We live in a house in New Wilford, but probably if we had lots more money at our disposal, we could buy some beachfront property in Hawaii. What keeps us from doing that? Well, oftentimes it's simply finances, right? And so we all know that although money can't buy happiness, it certainly can open up lots of doors in this life. However, as we get into our passage for this morning, we find that in this passage, we learn that although money may be able to open up a lot of doors and a lot of opportunities for us in life, there is one particular door that is mentioned here that money actually often prevents us from being able to open. In this passage, the rich young ruler is going to be a perfect case study regarding the danger of 
riches. And as I was studying, I was reading a commentary, and Warren Wearsby said this, Of all the people who ever came to the feet of Jesus, this man is the only one who went away worse than he came. Isn't that interesting? Of all the people we find in Scripture who come to the feet of Jesus with a sincere desire to be healed or to find strength or whatever the case may be, this is the only man, only person, who leaves worse off than when he came to Jesus to begin with. When everything was laid bare, we're going to see that this man chose his money and his riches over a true relationship with Jesus. And so today, the title is simply this, if you're taking notes, a devastating decision, because that's what this man made. He made a decision that not only saddened the Lord, but we see is going to sadden this man as well, and even more so if we could follow his life into eternity. Our key thought for today, and again, if you're taking notes, I would encourage you to write this down, is simply this. Money is not just a tool for survival in the physical world. It is the thermometer for our heart in the spiritual world. So money is not just a tool for survival in the physical world. It is a thermometer for our heart in the spiritual world. So let's go ahead and jump into this passage here and kind of uh, break it down together. And the first thing I want you to see as we are introduced to this passage is we see the request of the rich man. Now Mark begins the story by simply saying that there was a man who ran up to Jesus and knelt before him. It says simply that, as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now understand, this same story is shown to us in Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel, and both of them shed a little bit different light on who this man is. Luke lets us know that this man was a ruler. It says in Luke 18, 18, and a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So we have this man in Mark who is also a ruler. And then Matthew tells us that um, he was also young. Look at what it says in Matthew 19, 20. The young man said to him, All those I have kept, what do I still lack? So the same story, giving us a different glimpse into who this man is. So he's a young man. And all three of the Gospels focus on the idea that he was rich, that he had a lot of possessions. Here in Mark 10, in verse 22, it says, Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then Luke 18, 23 says this, But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And then Matthew says it like this, When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So all of them focus on the idea that he is rich, that he has lots of possessions. And we learn from the Gospels all combined that he was a young man who was a ruler, probably of the synagogue. And so when it came to his portfolio, he had pretty much achieved everything that you would want to achieve in those days. Right? He had position, he had power, he had money and possessions. Everything was good in his days. And you need to understand something about the theology of fit people back then. In those days, they believed that if you had wealth, it was a sign of being blessed by God. And if you were in poverty, it was a sign of being cursed by God. And so that was the theology by which they function in this culture as we read here in the Gospel of Mark. And so by all intents and purposes, this man had it all, right? He would have been a religious man who everybody else would look at and say, wow, he is spiritual. He is blessed by God. And what's interesting, as we read this story, we find a few things to be true about this man. Notice that as we go on here, and he was sitting out on his journey, a man ran up to him, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? To which Jesus then responds, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, Jesus is not saying here that he is not God. But what we need to understand, when this man came and said, Good teacher, that is a term that was only saved for God. You would not call any just normal rabbi a good teacher. 
So we learn that this man had an understanding of who Jesus was. He was not just your normal rabbi. He probably heard about the signs and the wonders and the miracles that Jesus had done. And so he comes to him with the knowledge that he is God, that he is this good teacher above all the other rabbis of the day. We also see that he was a religious man because in verse 19 it says, you know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And so we see that he was a religious man. He knew the commandments of God. He had kept them, at least according to his mind, since the time that he was young. But it's interesting. I think that as we read this story, we see that he kind of has an inflated view of himself, doesn't he? I've kept all these since I was young. Now, had he really probably kept every one of these commandments to the letter, to the T? Probably not. But what was he looking at? As a whole, he was a pretty good guy, right? And sometimes what we can tend to do is we can tend to, we tend to maybe compare ourselves to somebody else. Well, I'm good compared to this person. And compared to how this person keeps the commandments, I am good. And we see all these things. Well, here in those days, this man, for the most part, considered himself to be good and one who had kept the commandments from the time he was young. But it's interesting Despite his money, despite his fame, despite his position, despite his religiosity, he still comes to Jesus because his life is missing something. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Isn't that interesting? That despite everything he had, there was still something missing in his life. And so he comes to Jesus because he desperately wants to fill that void that nothing else in his life could fill. And so he comes to Jesus saying, what must I do to have eternal life? He had a poor, great portfolio and worldly success, but he was still unfulfilled. And he came to Jesus, I think, with good intentions, didn't he? He desperately wanted to know how he could have eternal life. And he had the right heart, the right desire, the right intentions. But in old ancient Proverbs says this, the road to hell is paved with what? Good intentions. He needed more than just good intentions. He needed a transformed heart that was going to be loosened from the riches that held him in bondage. And so he came with good intentions, but he was missing the point. You see, he came to Jesus saying, what must I do? And that is never the right question to ask Jesus, because there's nothing we can ever do to inherit eternal life. Jesus has already done everything necessary. And this man, although he was close, he was missing the point. It's not about what we do. It's about what Jesus has already done. He was measuring his goodness according to the wrong scale. And therefore, he came to Jesus because his life was missing something. He said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So we see the request from this rich, young ruler. Now I want to draw your attention to the response of the Savior, right? Because that's what we see next. The response of the Savior Jesus' response to this self-righteous man was simply this. You lack one thing. Look at what it says in verse 21. And, looking, and Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Isn't that interesting? It says Jesus loved him. Despite his heart not being exactly where it should be, despite him being more in love with his money than he was in love with the Lord, it says that Jesus still loved him. And it goes on to say... You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. That's all. You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have, and come, follow me. Again, their theology taught that, uh, that wealth equated to spiritual blessing. But here Jesus is saying, sell all that you have and come 
follow me. You see, Jesus recognized the idol with this, within this man's heart, and that was his wealth, his possessions. It had become an idol in his life. What is an idol? It's something that takes precedence over Jesus in your life. It's that place where you go to find security instead of going to Jesus. You see, that's where this man was. Now, an idol can be anything. We're talking about money here, but in your life, it could be something different. It might not be possessions or money. It could be a relationship. It could be a dream. It could be a career. It could be any number of things. But if there's something in your life that is taking precedence over Jesus, something that you're looking for and securing in other than Jesus, that thing is an idol in your heart. And the Bible has a lot to say about the idols that we so often tend to worship. Look at what it says in Galatians 6. Verse 7 8, do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So don't be deceived. If you're chasing after things of the flesh, you are missing out. That thing can be an idol in your life. Luke 16, again, talking about finances, says this, no servant can serve two masters. For either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. God cannot take residence in a home where money is already the God. And so we see here, the problem with this man was although he'd done all these other things externally that were good, he was too entrenched in his heart to the things that he had. And I love the fact that despite his idolatrous heart, we still see that Jesus clearly says here in Scripture that Jesus loved him. In David Guzik's commentary, he said this, Jesus was filled with loving compassion for this man because his life was so empty. He had climbed to the top of the ladder of success only to find his ladder lean against the wrong building. And so Jesus looked at this man and he loved him because he saw the emptiness in this man's heart. While everybody else looked at him and thought he had it all together because of all the wealth that he had and because of his position, Jesus looked at him with compassion and love because he understood that deep down this man was empty. And then we get to verse 22, which I think is one of the saddest verses in all of Scripture that says this. Disheartened by the saying, he, this rich young ruler, went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Isn't that sad to think about? That Jesus says just this one thing you have to do. And you can have eternal life. You can have peace and joy. And you can fill that void, that emptiness in your heart. Sell all that you have and give to the full core and come follow me. But yet because this man was so entrenched with worshiping his possessions, it says he left that conversation saddened, disheartened, because he was a man of great riches. A sad verse. And then Jesus goes on to make it clear that you, it is difficult for the wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. Look what it says in verse 23. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples how difficult it will be. So this man walks away saddened. The disciples are there looking on to this whole conversation. And Jesus makes this statement how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. Which brings us to the third thing I want us to see today, and that is the reaction of the disciples. So we've seen the request of the rich man. What must I do to inherit eternal life? We've seen the response of the Savior. This one thing is all you have to do. Sell all that you have, give to the poor, and come follow me. To which he chooses possessions over Jesus. And then Jesus says how difficult it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And then the disciples, it says, are amazed and said, let's look at their reaction. This, caught, this, this comment by Jesus catches them off guard because, again, I've said it multiple times, but their theology in those days said, if you have wealth and you have possessions and you have money, God is blessing your life. 
And so they don't quite understand. And they're amazed at the statement that Jesus would make. Because their theology taught them that riches were a proof of God's blessing. And not having riches were proof of God cursing your life. And then Jesus, to explain his point even farther, he's going to use a literary device known as hyperbole to help them understand what it is he's trying to say. And he uses this interesting hyperbole, and he says this in verse 25. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. What is hyperbole? It's an exaggeration that is not meant to be taken literally, right? In those days in Israel, the biggest animal that they would know of would be a camel. The smallest opening you would probably be able to think of is the eye of a needle. And so Jesus uses this exaggeration, this hyperbole to say how impossible it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Because the danger of money is that we can easily become attached to it and the things it allows us to possess. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Bible says this, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. So that is the problem, is that when we have possessions and when we have riches, our heart is prone to cleave to those things and we tend to want more, right? Because what we have is usually not enough. And I know how you are. You're sitting there saying, yeah, this rich man had a lot, but I'm not really rich, so this doesn't apply to me. Oh, contraire, because let me read you something. All right, this is in the book by Justin Kendrick where he's quoting various stats, a book called Bury Your Ordinary, and he says this, Do you own a car? The vast majority of the world's population does not. Do you have access to clean water? That puts you in a better position than 663 million people on the planet. Do you have make at least $20,000 a year? This may come as a shock, but that puts you in the richest 4% of the world's population. Do you make over $32,400 a year? You just landed in the richest 1% of people on planet Earth. So congratulations. You may not think you're rich, but compared to the rest of the world, you are. And so here, Jesus is not just speaking to a rich young ruler. He's speaking to American Christians in New Milford, Connecticut, saying you need to be careful. Because if you get too tied to your possessions and your finances and your 401k and all that's in your bank account, you have a proclivity to not be close to me. And he says that, and so the disciples are amazed. And they say, then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it is impossible, right? Because in our own flesh, we want to keep getting more and keep getting more and keep getting more. And we keep wanting to chase after, you know, the next dollar and the next thing that it can get and the newest car and the nicest house and all those things. But when we change our perspective and allow God to transform our heart, he begins to give us a new perspective about wealth. And so he says, with man, this is impossible because they'll continue to pursue it. But with God, all things are possible. Although it is impossible for man to buy his way into heaven, God can change a man's heart and do what man cannot do on his own. And so after hearing this, Peter reminds Jesus that they have left everything to follow him. Look at what it says. They say in verse 26, and who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. For all things are possible with God. And then Peter began to say to him, see, we have left everything and follow you. It's like Peter's kind of starting to put the pieces together. It's like, all right, Jesus, we left everything to follow you. So that's good, right? I mean, we've left everything. And then look at what Jesus says. Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold. Now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. So although it's impossible for man, it is possible with God. And Jesus here commends them for their selling of everything, for their giving up everything to follow Jesus, and encourages them about the blessing that comes to their lives as a result. Which then brings us to the final thing I want to draw your attention to this morning, and that is the ramifications of this passage. 
Right? We've been looking at it kind of as the passage itself. But now I want to bring it home, put it on the bottom shelf, bring it into our lives so that we can understand, okay, what do I take from this? What are the ramifications of this passage for my individual life? And I think there's many, but I want to boil it down to three applications or three ramifications from this passage that you and I should understand. And the first one is simply this. We must understand the basis of faith. We must understand the basis of faith. Eternal life has nothing to do with what we do. Eternal life has everything to do about what Jesus has already done. And this is the foundation of our faith. It's not anything about what I can do. I cannot inherit eternal life. I cannot be good enough to get there. The Bible says all my good works, all my righteousnesses are as filthy rags when it comes to earning my way into eternal life. Now, there's a lot of religions that teach you have to do certain things to get to God. That's where Christianity is different. Christianity is the only religion that says you can't do it. So God did what you can't do. Every other religion says I have to do or I have to give or I have to be or whatever the case may be. Christianity says, no, you're a sinner who can never do it. So Jesus has done what you can't do for yourself. And he died on the cross so that you can have forgiveness. And by you embracing that reality, he says you can have eternal life. It's done, but it's done by what Christ did, not by anything you can do. And the rich man said, what must I do? He had the wrong mindset. He was looking at it like so many other religions. And Jesus wanted him to understand it's about relationship. All that you possess means nothing or is insignificant compared to a relationship with me. So that's the first truth that we must understand. That the basis of our faith is not what we can do. It's what Jesus has already done. Another thing we must understand is the proper balance that this passage teaches us about riches. While trusting in riches is a great barrier to salvation, riches in and of themselves can also be a great tool in expanding God's kingdom. Would you agree? We don't see anywhere in scripture where it says riches or money is bad, but he says what? The love of money is the root of all evil. So it's when we get too tied to our money and it begins becomes an idol or a god in our life, that's where the danger sets in. Money in and of itself is neutral, but how we use it determines whether it becomes good or evil. I love this quote by Thomas Watson, so I put it on the screen because it's kind of long. It says this, water is useful to the ship and helps it to sail better to the haven. But let the water get into the ship. If it is not pumped out, it drowns the ship. So riches are useful and convenient for our passage, right? We'd all agree. Money's helpful as we live life, right? Without it, we wouldn't be able to really function and buy things and get the things we need. We sail comfortably with them through the troubles of this world. But if the water gets into the ship, or if love of riches gets into the heart, then we are drowned by them. So we have to be careful. There's a difference when it comes to money. And we have to understand there's a fine line between riches being a barrier and riches being a blessing. So don't find your security in money. Don't find your security in your possessions. Don't find your security in the things that you own, but use the money that God has given you to serve the Lord. Because as Billy Graham says, we are not cisterns made for hoarding. We are channels made for sharing. And so when it comes to this idea of money, be a person who learns what it means to live open-handed as opposed to closed-fisted. Being a person who recognizes, God, you've given me everything I have. You own a cat on a thousand hills. You're going to provide for my every need. All that I have is yours. And so I live with a generous heart. I live with a giving spirit because I know that you're going to provide. You're going to take care. And so I live open handed as opposed to a person who says everything I have, I've earned. It's mine. I'm going to live close fisted. I'm going to keep it all for myself. There's a big difference in those two ways. Of living. So we need to prioritize generosity. We need to learn to live with open hands and not closed fists. And I love how Adrian Rogers says it, a famous preacher of uh, earlier this past century. He says, God doesn't need a, to give us to give him our money. He owns everything. But tithing is God's way to grow 
Christians. Again, God doesn't need our money. And for some of you, what tithing? What's that? Well, in the Old Testament, the tithe represented 10%, right? And that was a requirement that God would have the people of Israel give to the Lord. 10% was kind of the, the base amount that they would give as offering to the Lord. So when they made you know, money, 90% they would keep, they would give 10% to the Lord. That's what the word tithe means, 10%. Now, in the New Testament, you don't see that word tithe necessarily mentioned. He doesn't require us to tithe, but he does still require us to be generous, right? He says, give joyfully. As you look at the life of disciple, you see a lot about generosity. And so does that mean the tithe just kind of disappeared? Well, I don't think so. We're in the age of grace, right? So if God under the law required 10%, in my mind, I think, well, doesn't that mean that in the law of grace, that's a starting point, and then I can give more because now God has blessed my life, and now here's where we start stepping on toes, right? Because we tend to think that everything we have, we've earned. And so it's ours. Instead of looking at it and saying, no, everything I have is God's, he's given it to me, and so I want to bless and be used and serve God with it. And that's why in Malachi, I think we need to do good to take God at, at his word. Because in Malachi chapter 3, the only place where God tells us to test him and to try him is in the realm of giving. He says, test me, and you give, and see if I don't open up the windows of heaven and bless your life. Now, sometimes those blessings don't always equate to physical riches, but he blesses your life in other ways. And I'm convinced in my life, there are things that have not broken down, things that have not been destroyed, things that have not happened in my life, because I've committed to be generous with what God has given me. Just like in the Old Testament, the Israelites wandered for 40 years in the wilderness, didn't need new shoes. That seems interesting. Why? Because God provided. He gave them longevity of those things. Now, again, this is not a sermon about you need to give your money to living stones because I tell you all the time, you don't give two living stones, you give three living stones. We could care less whether you give or you don't give. This is about your heart. And this is what Jesus is trying to get his disciples to understand. This rich young ruler was so connected to his money that he was holding it closed-fisted. And he was missing all the blessings that came with living open-handed. And so God says, test me, try me, see if I don't open up the windows of heaven and bless your life when you make a commitment to give. And so I would encourage you, if giving is not a regular part of your MO, why not test God and try it out and see if he doesn't bless your life? Because I promise you, you're going to see God work in amazing ways when you take this principle to heart. So we must understand the balance between riches being a blessing and riches being a barrier. And the third thing we must understand are the blessings of surrender. You see, when we live a fully surrendered life to the Lord, we are blessed both in this life and in the life to come. And that's what he says at the end here. As Peter makes that statement, he says this, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold. Isn't that good? When you sacrifice for the Lord, he promises that you will receive blessing in return. A hundredfold. Now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands, now there will be persecutions and hardships and difficulties, but then he says also, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. When we're fully surrendered to the Lord, he tells us that we are not only blessed in this life, but also in the life to come. So the ramifications of this passage, we must understand the basis of faith. It's not about what we can do, it's about what Jesus has already done. Understanding a proper balance of riches, that I can use them to serve God and expand his kingdom, or I can live closed fisted and they can become a barrier to my relationship with God. And then the third ramification is that we must understand the blessings of surrender. 
So here Jesus is getting right to this rich, young ruler's wallet. Now money can open a lot of doors in life, but it also can be a dangerous barrier that keeps us from living the abundant life that God desires. Money in and of itself is neutral, but we determine whether it is used for good or whether it is used for evil, whether it expands God's kingdom or whether it satisfies our fleshly desires. And the rich young ruler went away sad because his stuff was more important than the Savior. And so the question for us is, our stuff more important than the Savior? Now I know your answer. You're going to say, of course not. But proof is in the pudding, right? Actions speak louder than words. I can say a lot of good intended things, good intention things, but if my life doesn't reflect that, then am I really doing what I'm saying I'm doing? The rich young ruler went away sad because his stuff was more important than the Savior. So don't let that be your story. Because as I said in the beginning, money is not just a tool for survival. It's a thermometer for your heart in the spiritual world. So how's your temperature? What's the thermometer revealing in your life today? I'm going to end with this quote, again, by Adrian Rogers, because I think it's so powerful. You can sing all you want about how you love Jesus. You can have crocodile tears in your eyes, but the consecration that doesn't reach your purse has not reached your heart. So again, this is not a sermon about give more money to the church. If you've been here for very long, you know I very rarely talk about giving, but it came up in chapter 10, so <laughs> by George, we're going to cover it. <laughs> this is a, a sermon about you and your walk with Jesus. Because if you want the abundant life that God offers, and you want the peace and the joy that comes with the relationship with him, then how you handle your finances has a lot to do with the condition of your heart.